I just wanted to know so that Eric could do it, but Rez wouldn't know. Yeah, Eric, uh, you're, you're good. All right. So, without further ado, we shall begin. When we last left off, our players had emerged victorious once again, this time from the care of Care de Naval, the titular location within the city. High walls and fortification kept our allies at bay from their friend and companion, Alistair. Now, with the entire party of seven reunited, you guys are making your way to the town of Kerkonic. As you do so, can I get a marching order? Starting with who's going first. I would probably be leading it. Okay. So, Glenn... I'll follow and... behind Glenn. Awesome. Uh, Rez won't be at the back back, but it'll be towards the back. And... And uh, he's not bringing out his, his, his big boy, but he is going to be twiddling a song on his pan flute. Just a nice little marching song. How pleasant. As you guys are lulling into the step, hitting your marches succinctly uh, with the benefit of Rez's sweet soliloquy, Arnholt taking up the rear with him. I'm going to need Glenn to go ahead and roll me a perception check. Or a wisdom saving throw. It's up to you. Ooh. ooh Wait. Ooh, those are two very different things. <laughs> I know. I know. Very exciting. Uh, what's my... Where's my sheet? Oh, there it is. Wisdom saving throw. Oh, they're the same, so let's roll the perception. Okay. As you're marching forward, Glenn, you are the first to spot on the precipice of your vision, the horizon line in front of you. Dim though it is, you can make out at the foot of this massive mountain, Kelvin's Cairn, you can also see a small lingering cloud, almost like something has disturbed the snow beneath and caused it to roar up into the air. You see before you what looks like a very large snowstorm. Oh. Um, tell us, I think, maybe... Uh, are we headed towards it? Is that what you said? We're headed towards this, like, snowstorm? Yes, you are. As a matter of fact, um, since you're very familiar with the land, you know that it lies between you and the Karakonic. Uh, it, it may- I think it's gonna be in our best interest if we were to, uh, find a place to bed down for a while and see if we can ride up this storm in the distance and I point it out to everybody. Uh, now, uh, Rez, I'm gonna need you to pay attention. This is a little bit- Okay, so there's a storm. Big yes. One. Okay. Sorry. And I reckon we should probably bed down for a while rather than travel into it because I'm pretty close oh, to town. I do agree. Plus, you know, we haven't had much time to talk on the road, so. Yeah, and I think maybe a conversation's in order. Too. Oh, I think several are. Several indeed. So um, let's find somewhere to uh, bed down, <laughs> huh? Do Put I see anywhere tents? that like looks like it could provide any amount of shelter, or is it just like snow? Yeah, I'll I'll assist. I'll assist Glenn on looking for a, like a nice hovel or something. Okay, both of you guys go ahead and make me a nature check. For sure. Hell yeah. Um, Glenn, yeah, you do see exactly that. As you look around, you see a lot of snow. Um, there are some small inclines and hills, little recesses and craggy areas. Um, the best you guys could do is to set up your camp on the east or southern side of one of those small hills and make yourself a little settled. I very confidently uh, direct us over to uh, one of those hills and uh, on the southern side uh, propose we begin building our camp there. Okay. Rez. Oh, what, what if, okay, what if we did this? We take all of our tents and all of our shelter and stuff, and we all build it in, like, we dig out some of the snow, and we build one big structure for all of us. Conserve heat, m build a fire in there. You know, we've got all these tent poles and stuff, you know, everything we usually carry, so why not turn it into a big one? So you're proposing to build one large... Yeah, one large tent instead of our usual, like, three. That's fine with me. How does everyone else feel? We feel pretty good about that idea. At about that time, 
um, the Relis oh, kind of yes. looks it's around. Oh, yes! It's a good idea! Oh, thank you, Larry. <laughs> as Aurelas looks around and kind of overhears the bickering back and forth, he just looks plainly over, extends his hand forth, and a very warm, roaring, magical campfire <laughs> appears right in the center. Oh, okay. That, that helps. I, I'll be honest, I totally forget all the time that Aurelas can, like, do these things. Does he do, does he do stuff like this often, Res? Oh, I don't yeah, remember. Yes, yeah, it, it, it's not usually for our benefit, though. It's usually for, like, the detriment of other people. But he does it quite frequently. It's oh, just, I poof, there's a bonfire under your ass. He, he literally, he takes the saying, light a fire under someone's ass, and he takes it literally. Okay, he and I don't hang out much, so I don't know. Really no, oh, his... yes, no, he's quite strange. Oh. He had some time on the boat, and he was, he was pretty distant. Anyways, help me get this big tent up, because if it... If that so snowstorm is a blizzard and it buries us, we're all going to be in individual tents buried in snow. At least this way, we're all together and we can use our minds to work this out. Okay, I begin uh, helping him uh, organize this Diatlov Pass incident that we're about to go through. So you guys definitely do have enough leathers. However, do you actually possess a tent in your inventory? I think I do. I'm pretty sure I do. Let me double check. I do not. Where? <sighs> Fuck, and I can't even find my notebook with all my notes. Oh, shit, so no, I'm like, just, I'm like yeah. lost in the dark right now. I've just got, uh, I've got a bedroll. Never mind, I thought I had a tent. I think if we, like, take all of our bedrolls and stuff, like, we can scoot out the snow. Melt the snow away, scoot out the snow. And if we have a, a, a bubble, like a, a tent bubble, that can protect us from the snow, from the elements, and we can keep our fire in there, then... Uh, I think that's better than sleeping comfortably just on the ground under the stars. If we just take all of our bed rolls and stuff and turn that into a tent. Because it's gonna... There's a storm coming and all we have is, is this fire. Absolutely. So we, we need, yeah. we need uh, some form of shelter. Okay, you... that's a good start. Uh, Garrett, can we can you check Erland and Larry and Aralis' inventory to see if they have a tent? Erland has a tent, Larry does not have a tent, and Aralas, I don't believe he keeps his character sheet on Roll20, but we, we will shortly find out. Either way- I also have a ton of cloth. Oh yeah, and yeah. Alistair, as you witness Rez kind of conducting the planning uh, alongside Glenn and then getting everything together, you do surmise that you could, with your artificial abilities, actually sew together even pieces of leather to make a tent as you do have the right tool for the job yeah we need a big fucking tent that we can I'd all like, fit in comfortably I'd like to offer my service and I'm gonna pull out leather and cloth oh gather okay. what supplies you have here I'll get to work and I'm gonna start sewing stuff together and strengthening it with bits of wood and stuff to give it a structure so I'll start like I'll take my dagger and start like uh like all the any fabric that just comes together weird I'll just make sure it is an easier piece to work with for him awesome so that it, it's just you know instead yeah. of awkward pieces I've got and I'm like gonna, an extra set of clothes I'm gonna kind of point and guide since I only have one arm I'm gonna be like alright you gotta help me here and there and I'm just kind yeah. of doing the stitching with one hand you watch as Erlon kind of accompanies Glenn. All right, well, if you have another uh, piece of clothing, uh, you can put it in for extra bedding. Is he telling me that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, something I do remember that I have from that castle, I believe, is some noblemen, like some very nice attire. So I'm going to look at Alistair like as I pull it out after we've like moved on to some of the other tent making areas when there's a little bit of a lull and I say do you think you could help me turn this into like a nice comfy pillow it's not really my style but it's gaudy like I like so I want to I don't want to wear it I just want I think it'd be cool to be like a pillow I can do that fuck yes 
you guys uh, have the small community then look back at the fortification between everybody's assistance the right tool for the job from Alistair and the survival nature of Erlon bearing through you guys have a pretty substantive if makeshift tent ready to go um, it looks very I'm efficient assume. magically sewn together and hemmed at different imperfections but nonetheless um, you do suppose that a sturdy enough force could probably destroy it I I want to assume, but if we didn't, I want to make sure that we did include one of those like vent things at the top, where like all this, all the fabric comes up to one thing with a hole, and there's another piece on top of it to prevent rain or snow getting in, but like smoke and shit can get out, so we don't suffocate ourselves. Erlon kind of be... looks back and he's like, yeah. "Oh yeah, I was uh, thinking of doing something like that. Uh, it's a good idea." Okay, so our tent. I assume it's kind of like a yurt. <laughs> yeah, it is. It like, is. We, we made a little yurt on in, into the side of this uh, into this hill. Round at the bottom, there is a definite opening flap about three feet tall, and the top steeps of leather spiral to a very shallow point, which allows the smoke to evade. Okay, so now we have a comfortable abode. Let's set up and eat some provisions and have a conversation, shall we? Oh yes, I have so many questions to ask all of you, as Arnholt is the first to go inside the tent. Once uh, Alice was down, not right by the fire, but like close enough for the light, um, I'm going to take out one of my uh, cray cat pelts, and I'm going to sew it into the inside of my jacket. So it's like a fur-lined jacket. And it's also going to have, like, fur on the lapels and the collar. Oh, very nice. Okay, so after about, I would say, 30 minutes with your right tool for the job, you get it to be very nice. And as you are actually disrobing your warm winter clothing, you notice, Alistair, the cold is not biting you nearly as much, especially um, without your warm weather clothing on. As the rest of you are gathered now inside the yard, you see Oralas and Arnholt and some casual conversation as you guys break through the tent. Oh, welcome. Come here often? Oh, actually, no. I don't make my way out to the spot. Oh, you should do it. It's really nice this time of year, huh? He, like, wipes Not some soot and snow off his shoulder. How's your arm? Ah, uh, you know, not a uh, part of my body. Ah, uh, well, it was kind of rhetorical. And the stuff kind of is... The is Quite healed, actually. Uh, yeah, nice no, I know. I did. I, I did that. Yeah. It's very nice. You, you better be grateful. You so, could have gotten like gangrene or something. So. Uh, speaking of which, he pushes his hand deep within a leather satchel that's on Arnhold's hip, and he brings out a black ball of fur, cuddled in his arms. As he brings. Theodore closer to the fire. Theodore kind of stretches out his feline limbs and opens his mouth with a definite yawn. Oh, look at that little guy. Scritch, scritch, scritch. At about which time, Erlon walks into the yurt. As he comes in through the flap in the wall, you see, or rather hear, a low... <sighs> oh, what is Bond wrong, little he... guy? Keep that thing away from my brother's cat. At about that time, you watch as Tiger pushes his head and shoulders out of the satchel. You can tell just by those features that he has been aging rapidly. His whiskers have started to grow in, fur splitting off the top of his white furred ears. Um, like a little albino wolverine. That's right. And Erlon quickly pacifies him with a ration. Oh, sorry about Tim. He, he will not hurt your kitty cat. So, Alistair, I think uh, the, the real conversation today is going to be uh, your situation first off. Okay, yes. Any prison tattoos? Any, anything that is looser now than when you went in? You think you're real funny? Uh, occasionally I do. Anyways, real, real talk. As a joke, I suggested, because I wanted to wait a few more minutes, you know, just to see what would happen. As a joke, I suggested, hey, what if he escaped? And then we pass each other in the chaos. 
And uh, then as we're storming the castle and uh, attacking and spells are flying left and right, uh, your happy ass walks through the front gates and joins the fight. And uh, so what the hell? Hey, I uh, got some assistance getting out. A woman by the name of Avarice. At about that time the name is spoken, you do watch as Arnhold kind of stretches his head forward and rubs the back of his neck. Oh, Arnhold. What? Did you have someone in prison? No, I, I've never heard that name before. Arnhold. And I insight check him. What? I also would like to. <laughs> what? I'm gonna get his ass. Damn it. You know, Glenn, and even you, Rez, that he knows who Avarice is. Glenn, you are especially confident as he looks up. Okay, okay, um, yeah, I, I know who she is. Uh, she was uh, one of uh, the cultists of Vin Okay, and who how, how did was... she end up? Yeah, how did she end up in prison? Well, she had quite a following. Um, however, Heathel is the old woman we met, and um, of course Kaldroth didn't like her. They thought that she would become the leader instead, so... And he does like a little pantomime walk with his hand. They threw her into the cistern. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, second question. You said that, and I have many questions for you, but I don't know if now is the right time, but you said that... Whatever this cult was worshipping, you said that it had spoken to you. What what spoke to you? What was they worshipping? Well, uh, they called him many names. The Frost King, uh, the man of everlasting winter. However, I knew him as Levistus, but first he spoke to me in Avalon. Does that name ring a bell? Um, Levistus, you do um, know vaguely just from your encounters with the cults um, and hearing it spoken as the last word on the final breath of some of the assailants in the castle. However, can aside make, from that, you really have no idea. Can I make like a history check or something to see like now that I have time to process what's going on, I like can I try to recall anything about that name like have i did i learn about it in school did i not really I mean, it's a yeah. super unknown deity especially where you were from okay so this levistus uh talked to you in avaloft yeah before or after the fall of our house before everything back then i was naive enough to think that it was the minstrel but i know better Alistair, with your with your arm with your arm situation there, um, how do we fix this? I noticed you got the one. Bit I need to forge a new one. Bit to forge. Okay, one. that is a good point, but I also want to get back to some more questions for Alistair. Glenn, you might be on board. Roll. Uh, uh, because you know you look a lot different. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Your eyes are blue. I'm not sure what colors they were before, but they sure as hell went that blue. I think they were like a uh, hazel. Yeah, something like that. I didn't really give a shit, but now like it's it's like a vibrant blue, and your your skin is pale as fuck. You look like a vampire. So, you didn't go in looking like that. So, what exactly happened? They threw me in there with the devil oh. the devil was belonging to avarice do you mean like an a you don't mean like an actual devil do you big beastie oh now Is 
Is it just him? As you watch the glacier like <laughs> snowy skin of Alistair solidify for a second. <laughs> you guys sit around, and as you kind of breathe in this atmosphere, you do watch as a few <laughs> drops of snowfall begin lingering down the center of the precipice, and actually they begin to extinguish parts of the flame. We. I, I thought I made it clear that it, like there's a hole in the roof, but we made one of those things that's like an umbrella that goes over the hole, mm -hmm. so that snow and shit can't get through, but smoke can get out. Oh, you you made sure, and yet nonetheless. Okay, since since our friend has has frozen, I am going to just check the tent flap just to look outside. As you look out, the dim light has subsided into a near evening darkness. However, as you look out through the green and blue hues still present in the sky, you notice as the snow is not only falling, but actually whipping very fast. Shards of it catch you in your face, rest all of you, and as you look up, you can see that the blizzard is fast approaching. I close it. I look back. There's icicles in my mustache and goatee. Uh, my hair is, my hat, like, flew on the ground that's behind me. I bend down, pick it up, wipe the icicles out of my hair. That literally could not have been at a worse time. I mean, you were, you literally, you paused for dramatic effect and then the game crashed. My, yeah, everything went down. That's okay. Everybody's back? Yep. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm moving to my phone for Discord. That's a very wise decision. So... Zooming back in, as the camera refocuses in the yurt, you guys are gathered inside, and Rez, as you return with frost in your goatee, icicles in your mustache, what would you like to do? Oh, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, it's coming down really hot out there, so I button up the flap. Uh, if you have to piss, do it now before we get buried in here. And Brett, Rez is gonna like piss out the door. Sounds great. So you guys sit in there a while. The snow begins to accumulate. You can see even from the piss strand that's illuminating and then freezing the solid white snow in front, Rez quickly zips up raises his trousers, so to say. And as he comes back into the yurt, you guys can now feel the wind and the snow violently thrashing the sides. As a matter of fact, at this point, Larry's rock tumbles out of its pocket as she How? as she hops to the side. The rock lays dormant on the floor. So, would you guys Larry, like to... You, you dropped your rock. Oh, uh, yes, uh, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Glenn. Anytime. As she returns the rock <laughs> to her possession, holding it firmly, you guys notice a little blue magic energy plumes out of the rune across the front. And with that, the snow begins pushing at the walls of the yard, actually eking out beneath it as the stakes weren't down completely. As you guys watch snow now coming beneath you, not even from the top, just emerging from the bottom of the floor, what would you guys like to do? Um, uh, can someone burn it? Can someone burn it? Give me someone a moment. Melt the snow. <laughs> Let me try this. And Arolas, with a flick of his hands, ignites the flames. As they burn faster and faster, you watch as the snow is melting on that precipice, but still growing to encapsulate the campfire. Uh, this is strange. Uh, uh, I I shoot the ground. I shoot the, the bulge of snow. <laughs> as you do, there is there is a large space of fire that warms it up and shows you the bare ground underneath. I thought we said we had cleared the snow beforehand. You if did, not, you did, you did, but it's coming back, yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay, maybe fucked. 
I have yeah, no, I have, I have, no, I have like, no idea what to do. <laughs> I have nothing. I have nothing for this. Um, uh, I'll actually, move my mage hand. Hold, uh, no. As Aralis begins kicking the snow out, inevitably the snow garners in until the point that it's not over your bedrolls, but it's just eking in to that campfire. The warmth of your bodies and the fire are still keeping most of it at bay. So, with this kind of cold, kind of murky, yet somewhat warm space, do you guys want to weather out the night? I pull my bedroll in a little bit closer to the fire. <laughs> I think I think we have to uh, ride this one out, fellas. I think we even. Yeah, I think we have to. I think we have to fucking deal with this, and hope that the the fire and the warmth around here is going to make like the the snow that falls around us like hard, and hopefully that keep gives us like a shell so we don't die of, of snow in the night. Yeah. Alistair, what do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't just sit here all night. We've got to devise some way of keeping it a little bit warmer. I've been training have, my Alistair I've for so long. Got, I have ten torches. I don't. <laughs> I you know that them. might actually come in handy. That's a good idea. Yeah, you, you should put know. one between like each bedroll. Absolutely. Put one in one in each bedroll. That way you can cuddle up. Um, Curl up with a lit torch. It's a brilliant yeah, idea. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I'll uh, I'll light a torch and I'll put them. Are you saying like between the bedroll and like the wall of the tent, or like uh, at the edge of the bedrolls, like close, not right at the edge of the tent, so it doesn't catch fire. Right. But just just enough so it's like bet like if we were sleeping in a circle around the fire, like between each of the bed mats to just kind of clear out that snow. How many torches do you think it would take, DM, for me to, like, encompass us in a little bit of warmth? So let's assume that this yurt is big enough that the bottom of it encompasses, like, a 20-foot diameter. So if okay. that is the case, five torches. Five torches? Okay, I'm gonna light- I'm gonna go ahead and I'll light five of them and I'm gonna make a little ring. It's Alistair's here's tiny After Alistair's tiny hut is finished fabricating, it is a lot warmer in here, and actually, as you guys settle in for a night's rest, the most annoying thing is the constant light. But, that's enough for you, and you guys inevitably fall to sleep. Yeah, cool. As you guys all are rendered <laughs> unconscious, I need everyone to go ahead and make me a perception check. Including you, Gasper. Gotcha. Perception check. There's so much that needs to be talked about, and, like, nobody's here to talk about it. Yeah, that really is a shame. Ooh, very good roll by Mr. Glenn. I'm rolling. I'm trying rolling. to get mine up right now, but my computer's being fucking slow. Just say a number. Don't pick a number. <laughs> uh, seven. Ooh, oh, I sorry. wasn't wrong. Not enough. Alright. So. In that order. Glenn, as you wake up first, you come to and immediately you feel a huge cold blanket weighing over you. As you see the snow as it infects your body and you look around and see your other allies coming to out of their sleep as well, go ahead and roll me a constitution saving throw. Okay. Fuck, we didn't establish a watch. That was too All tired. Alright, Glenn, you power through it for now. And with that, as you look up, Rez, you wake up, and you look around, and you notice, as you, Glenn, and Alistair are now awake, that something has happened that has ripped part of this tent off, and snow is now coming through from the back, from the front, where the open flap is, and everything is extinguished, except for the low, lingering magic campfire. Okay, so, it's not like, some, it's not like snow caved in on. No, and you can barely hear yourself. So, just like, our tent was ripped open. Pretty much is what it looks like. Not from an animal, or any claw marks that are discernible, but almost from the wind itself. I shake Larry immediately awake. <gasps> and What's going on? And I tell, 
Larry, go use your mending. You and Alistair, use your mending and fix the fucking tent. Okay, Alistair, come on! Alistair, without even robing, is the first out and Larry's quickly behind him. As they disappear into the whipping display of blizzardy, icy, just fog and current, what would you like to do? I'm still gonna help him, like, pull the tent, like, as close together as I can and hold it from the inside. Alright, Glenn, as you watch Rez trying to do this, what are you doing? Uh, I'm taking, uh, <coughs> one of my, uh, tender boxes and trying to reignite the, uh, bonfire that's in the middle. Alright, Glenn, roll me a survival check, and Rez, roll me a strength check as you're trying to pull this tent down as fast as you can. Glenn, first strike off the match, you get it going. And as you lean forward to blow smoke into the fire, Rez is clambering at the back flap as he gets it down in time. He gives you just enough wind to spark that flame. What are you doing with it, Glenn? I'm just trying to fan it and get it going just to get some heat in the area. Um, and, uh, let's see, do I have anything to help with the tent situation? I well, think I do. let me say, as you get that campfire roaring at a faster burn and a raw loss kind of clumps to out of his slumber and helps you, the room is now illuminated, and you can see at, this top, at the top of the yurt, that very flat point has now became a valley. And as the top of the yurt is caving in with the weight of the snow, you can see this, all of you. Um, fuck. Fuck. Uh, how tall is the tent? It's approximately 12 feet high. 12 feet high? Um, at its nice. tallest. Uh, you want to get on my shoulders and brush some snow off the top? <laughs> right, because we have actually you can, you can like see through the top, right? Because like he said, it's like an umbrella space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That point is still visible, but the sides have accumulated some snow and are now kind of dipping. So, Rez is going like as he's like holding the tent, and Alistair and Larry are fixing it. He's gonna like peek his head out and use his mage hand to just start batting snow. Mm. Like left, left and right, just grrr, all over the top of the the thing, getting off as much snow as possible. And it is very effective. You're actually fanning the snow idea. off, and Glenn, as you're kind of pushing him, you guys feel really successful at your job. And as you two look over, you see Alistair and Larry running backwards towards you. They're about twenty feet away from the tent now. They're running backwards towards us? Well, running towards you guys, but from the direction they just came. Oh, okay. But why'd they, why'd they go all the way? Why were, why were they ever that far out? Well, well, if they were going to go to the back of the tent, which is 20 feet in diameter, they would have just stopped from repairing, and they're coming back now. So they're, about, they're right at the end okay. of their run. As okay. You, as you guys witness them running back, you can see behind them. Rez, because you're the only one looking out right now, currently. Rez, you can see a huge rolling cloud of snow right behind them. And this is about 25 feet away. Oh. We're fucked. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I... Everyone get in and close. Get close. Uh, yeah. Everyone brace. Get inside! And, and when I, she I says that... Hold, no, I like... I like, oh, does she have her fucking steel def metal defender? Uh, whatever the fuck that thing is? Yeah, he's been in the tent. He's in the tent. Sure. Can we can we all, like, gather behind him as much as we can so, like, he'll, like... I don't know. Yeah, everyone, that. like, hunch up by his legs. Everybody get saw And before Alistair can finish his sentence... Oh, he's back. You guys watch as the snow and the blizzard... <laughs> removes all vision from the space as that happens and everybody is crammed in and the snow is layered on top of them Glenn and Rez you're the only ones who made it behind the steel defender you two go ahead and give me constitution saves at advantage okay Alistair give me a constitution saving throw and 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 Arnhold should <coughs> yeah Arnhold yeah. should be in on that too because I, I like pulled him in Oh yeah, that's true. Arnholt is is also back there with advantage. Good point. Very good. 
Alistair, as you make it back, you're almost to the yurt, when you, along with everyone else, is suddenly buried in snow. You muted yourself. Alistair, you make it back just to the vicinity of the yurt, when you, along with everyone else, is suddenly buried in snow. As it takes you guys a while to get into your new surroundings, buried and covered with this thick sheet of ice, Alistair, you succeed as you have no fault to cold damage, you are fine. Rez, as you roll the lowest and you only roll a 10, you have one point of exhaustion. As you guys are still buried beneath the snow and oxygen is lingering, Glenn and Rez, you see as the steel defender suddenly begins to move. <laughs> one arm after the other that churns the snow you guys are buried you can only see its metal ankles but as it breaks free from the white sheet Glenn and Rez you find the catch of her oh my god this fucking weather oh, this fucking weather I, uh, I hate this place I hate it so much oh, you, get, you, you get used to it I gotta tell you I don't ever Holy want shit. to get used to it this place okay. sucks with that Let's scanning, where is it? I was going to say, is there anyone I start else digging there? through the snow. You guys literally don't see anything, and Glenn Shit. and Rez, as you cover through the snow, you see beneath <laughs> it the face of Arnholt. I see. <gasps> oh, come here often. Oh. oh, fuck off. And I pull him out of the snow. <laughs> He's slow to get up as he pushes himself with one arm. As he holds his stub, which is kind of in pain. He, uh, let's find the others. Help me look. Yeah, I'm just like I'm... large, like areas where like I kind of remember if I saw anyone like the yeah, area. the entire where, area where... of the tent. I'm yeah, I'm mage handing like all around where I'm actually digging too, so I have a bigger search area. Okay. Yeah, you two scoops tossing. You two go ahead and give me perception checks. Okay. Alistair, go ahead and give me a dexterity or a strength check. Glenn and Rez, as you guys look over thoroughly, you can't find much, but you do find a very sea elven outline before you. <coughs> Glenn. Awesome. <coughs> Fucking scooping, getting snow, just like throwing it wherever. As you see, he's kind of prodding through with something that's knocking the other side. You know he's alive, and as you unturn it, you see Erwan trying to jam his trident up. Oh, oh thank you so much. I grab the trident, oh tell him God. to hold on to it, and just start like, pulling him out like via the trident. Uh, thank you. Wait, where's Tiger? And as Erlon begins sweeping the premises looking for his pet, Alistair, you are trapped beneath the ice. Try as you might, Alistair, you bang up with your arm, even with your metallically clasped stub, which is basically a destroyed metal arm, you prod and not only can you not get out, Alistair, you don't even know which way is up until, as you look through that white sheet in front of you, a fist <laughs> comes through. A very blue, cyan, shining fist. The same fist belonging to your dragonborn ally, Otaku. Let's go. I'm gonna grab the fist. Otaku, as Alistair grabs your hand beneath the snow, what would you like to do? Gasper. Am I still in a stone? Nope, you're up. Okay. Yeah, I think you just pulled Alistair from the snow. That's right. Uh, Alistair, are you okay? And Larry should be right next to Alistair. Yeah, that's I look true. for out oh, is the uh, metal giant still there? Yep, the metal giant has just come out the back side, or rather the front of the yurt. Your back side is where he emerges. And as he comes out, Erland, Rez, and Glenn, I assume you'd want to follow suit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright. Just still yeah. certain, like, I'm frantic. I okay. 
As you guys yeah, come I'll, through, go ahead. I'll find. I real like I do. I, I see Alistair being pulled out of the snow, right? That's right. You see him and Otaku. Okay. So I realizing that. Uh, I, I'll, I'll start looking for for Larry, and I'll shout over to Glenn, and I'll say, "You stop looking for Aralis." I'll start trying to like in the same area where Alistair was. I'll start looking for Larry. Is there right. any memory of where Aralas uh, was, like in the tent, whenever that hit? Um, you know that he's somewhere with inside the yurt, but you weren't exactly sure. It's a pretty wide yurt. Okay. Go ahead and make me a perception check, Glenn. You, you did like set him, him down. Yes, that is correct. And um, Rez, go ahead and roll me another perception check too, if you'd like to look. Okay. Glenn, you can't find much. Um, through the snow, you can find some of his belongings, even the campfire is still lingering, so you know he must be alive. Just not sure where he is. Rez, on the other hand, as you go to the spot where you know Larry is, and you dig beneath the snow, something else catches your view. A bright, beaming light, almost like the headlight of a car, strikes your vision. It sends it blurry for a second, and as you look up, Rez, you can see two hooded figures walking towards you. Guys, there's uh, there was a light, and then now there's two people walking towards us. Uh, maybe they are uh, wanderers like us. Maybe, but uh, we don't have a fucking shelter anymore. Just got fucking destroyed. Yeah, tell them the way that they get to digging whenever they get here. Bez, Res, I'm gonna become a stone. I want you to throw me behind them if you can. Oh, okay. Yeah, leave it to the bot. Okay. So, yeah. Otaku, as you so, whoop, and you return to the snow, you can see there is a stone where you're currently digging, Rez, and that's where Otaku absorbs into. Okay, I, I, I pick up the stone. How far away do these guys look? Um, through the dense snow, you couldn't see them um, until they were rather close. Right now, they're about 15 feet away, and they're walking at a very low Pace. Yeah, I, I huck the stone to like behind and to the right of them. You watch as they stop, and two of them, the only two, I should say, both of them, look towards the stone and just kind of stare at it for a second. Can I say I did that stealthily? <laughs> Very sneaky stone throw. It's a little too late for that, but as they both Damn look it. at the stone, they kind of gather near it, and then after discerning that it is no use to them, they walk back towards the tent. As they're drawing near now, they're about ten feet away. Okay, you can stop there. We don't know who you are. They keep walking. And I came out of the I, stone. I pull out my gun and I, I, I hold it out and I say, "Stop where you are. If we don't know you, we will attack." You hear a sword unsheathed, and as you look over, Arnhold's holding his rapier, pointing it in the same direction, and you watch as a blue lingering light manifests behind them. Otaku, as you come out of your stone form, you see the backs of these two characters, hooded and covered with warm winter clothing. You can't see much, Otaku, but you do see their spinal columns are protruding. Through the robes. Through the robes? You can see uh, you can see their spine. Ew. But okay. Stab him. Kill him. Yeah. Um, when I come out there, I heard what Russ say to them. Yes. Are, and they're still walking, right? That is true. Okay, um, I shoot my bow. Um, on my uh, right. Uh, which one? I mean, on the right side from on my right side. So, so the one on your right. right. That's right. My the one right. on your right. So, okay. As I see him do this as well, I'm gonna shoot my gun just straight in the air. Like in <laughs> warning. As you guys hear this gunshot, the two figures suddenly come to a close. Everybody, roll initiative. Good evening, friends. Welcome back. With Should this... I open the webcam right away? 
You should. Glenn, as you hear this gunshot explode and ripple through, you notice something moving beneath the blizzard. Beneath the avalanche of snow which has befallen you, you can see Aralas moving. Aralas, go ahead and roll me a constitution save throw. Welcome to the initiative. Sec. Con save. Indeed. Oh, Glenn, as you look before you, Aralas easily gets out of the snow and he looks up at you. Aralas, you've been buried underneath the snow for about 10 minutes. Oh, uh, here I am. Uh, sorry about the. Sorry, I was cut out there for a second. <coughs> yeah, it must have gotten lost or something, buddy, but there's a situation you and I are gonna need, need to be present for. Also, real quick, DM, did we get a rest out of that? Or are we yeah, like, you guys you guys got a long rest did? miraculously. Thank you. Okay. Scraped it by by the skin of our teeth right as that, right as everything went down. All right, Aralas and Glenn, as you guys are getting ready back in the tent, Alistair and Rez, you stand stalwart with Arnholt as these two figures approach. As they come closer, they're now literally <coughs> six feet away. Do you guys open fire? Yeah, I, I'm going to shoot them. Like, they, they come that close. I, I said stop or I'll shoot, and I'm shooting. Okay. Makes sense to me. And did my error landed at first when I shot it. Oh, that's true, because you shot immediately from the gate. Alright. As you guys get to there, we're going to start at the top of the chart. Otaku, as you got the initiative, I need you to go ahead and fire with your short bow. and 1d6, right? Yeah, that's right. Very nice. Aralas, as you get that breath in your lungs, you guys hear the gunshot, and you and Glenn look towards the sound. It is outside of the yurt, and you do see the two figures. As they look up, you see their faces, or rather lack thereof, is just a bright, gleaming blue light. All right. Good damage as you hit them in the back. Otaku, you don't see them move, but your arrow definitely found its place. What else do you want to do? So you say they didn't move, right? They didn't move. They're still standing there. I'm going to try to like be a little bit closer to them, but not too close at the same time. Okay. And try and talk to them and, hey, why are you guys doing it here? One looks over at you, just the sound of your voice, and with this bright blue light that your face basks in, you can tell that this creature is indifferent. Is that in your turn? And when I sense that danger, I kind of step back a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, you didn't get quite close enough to get within their melee range. So if that ends your turn... Yes. Glenn, what would you like to do? I would, uh, uh, I'm just gonna open the fight, I guess, if I, let's see, I need, and they, whoa, they were close as fuck, um, oh. and I'll just make a swing on this fella here, um, and that'll probably be the bulk of my turn, I don't know how tough these fellas are, so let me roll to hit there, it's a 16 hit. Divine smite! <laughs> That is a great question. Does it hit? Whew. Alright. Did it? Sorry about that. For okay. some reason their AC is not coming up. Alright, finally. That did hit. Roll for damage. And oh, wait, sorry. you're striking at the one closest to you, correct? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, guys, we're having some issues with the turn order, but it should all be good. Alright, as you take that in, you guys hear a massive whack as a smashing and scattering of bone fragments litter the snow. However, these two what appear to be immobile creatures just stand there. What else do you want to do, Glenn? Oh my god, I don't know. Um, 
I'm gonna stay in the melee range so as to not uh, garner an attack of opportunity, but I am gonna stand here just to put some sp like a, a space between uh, the this creature and Reds. Okay, and that's gonna end your turn? Yeah. Alright. Alistair, what do you want to do? Well, there's really only one thing I can do, so I'm gonna take a shot with the blunderbuss at this guy over here. Okay, that definitely hits. Ooh, 15 piercing damage. Okay, as you take that shot, you guys hear this massive gunshot ring and many bone fragments and shreds of broken cloth fly off this creature. It lunges forward before its head quickly snaps to Alistair, detecting him as a threat. Now, which one was that on? It was this guy over here. Okay. Awesome. Does that end your turn? Uh, it does, since I can't do a bonus action. I understand completely. Up next, this first cold light walker is going to look around. As it makes a complete circle, you guys can now see its ankle bones connected with black pieces of frostbitten flesh, a very strong skull, and what appears to be a protruding spine that Otaku saw earlier, and is just going to make a massive cold ray attack. As it looks out towards you, does a 10 hit Otaku? On, the, on my dexterity, or...? On your AC. What is your AC? AC's 14. Doesn't hit. It doesn't hit. So as this ray whoom, of very solid with low humming energy shreds for you, you detect it as a threat and you dodge out of the way. As you do so, this other cold light walker is going to look straight ahead and produce its own cold ray. So, that is a natural 20. And that is going to hit Glenn. Rez. No. And Oralas. Oh my god. Wow. Wait a oh, minute. Geez. Well, I can't Perfect believe lineup. it. We gave it to him. We All really right. did. Yeah. Alright. So. What do we need to roll? Do we need to roll anything? All three of you are unconscious. Fuck. Like, no shot. <laughs> like, yeah. do we go down to zero hit point? Yes. What? What? <laughs> that did... 30 damage. It did 30? Oh, Is sorry. Is there any Well... Actually, yeah, Glenn, Glenn. Well, it's just an attack. Glenn, you are good. Well, <laughs> not only does that attack inflict 4d10... But it is a natural 20. So yeah, you guys are both down. And as this screaming ray of energy burrows through, you look over Alistair and witness all three of your friends blasted from their feet and fall to the ground. Glenn is the only one to stand up, and Aralas, go ahead no, and roll me a death th saving throw. Th there's, there's seriously no save with that. It just hits and we die. It's an attack, yeah. That's how attacks work, yeah. DM roll... If it was a disintegration spell, not only would you be dead, but you'd be disintegrated as well. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, Aralas. That was um, a very appropriate roll. Um, Rez, um, you get your death save right now. All right. Remember to GM roll that, but... With your natural Sorry, twenty, I, I I I I click, I click GM. That's like, fine. I the... Yeah, yeah. Don't don't worry about the, it. It's the, all good. The one time I I don't type it in. <laughs> You're okay. Don't even worry about it. But with that, you are alive and sitting at one HP right now. You are stabilized. Oh. I'm stabilized, shit. or I have one HP. Um. I think it's both. I think when you are stabilized, you do yep. get one HP. Um, if that's not yep. the case, we'll we'll do it later. But yeah, right now you have one HP. Oh, With gosh. that, Arnholt will start his turn. They killed my brother, you bastard! Uh, As he runs forward, Arnholt is going to take both of his attacks. Oh, I forgot he made so many onto this guy. That hits. 
That hits. Arnholtz making a series of attacks. Does so without effort. And with that... Oh, what's that last one? There we go. It totaled Hell 24 yeah. piercing damage as he stabs this essentially bone-ridden creature. Perfect. And with oh. that, Gasper, it is finally your turn. Otaku Yamade, what do you want to do? I know there's something wrong about them, so I kind of go through my inventory, see what I can do. So is it possible I combine with the flask of oil and hooded lantern together and throw it at them? Yes, but that is going to be your action. Yes, that will be my action. Okay, so you want to put the oil in the lantern and throw it and hope it ignites. Yes. Okay, if that's what you want to do, go ahead and roll me a d20. Because you don't have proficiency with um, improvised weapons. So it's just going to be a straight roll. Okay. <laughs> As it lands, you guys see it sitting there for a while, and over the course of a few minutes, oil leaks out and covers this massive range uh, right about here. As you guys see, this area is now coked in oil. What else do you want to do, Otaku? You have a bonus action and your movement left. Um, I, I'm gonna sh use my breathing attack. What is it called again? It's been your f oh your 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 dragonborn breath weapon. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can do that as a bonus action. Um. Okay. You know, let me see something. That should be a little bit higher. Is it because of my level? Yeah, yeah, or... yeah. You didn't you didn't take your level into. That's okay. The DC should be thirteen. And they both need to give me dexterity, which these guys are not very good at. Alright, first guy fails. And the second guy also fails. As they both fail, they take a massive blast of your acid damage. As it coats through their skin, it melts away their clothing. And you guys can now see these two undead frostbite victims in all of their naked glory. Does that end your turn, Otaku? Yes, that ends my turn. Okay. Good job with the breath weapon. You, you really hurt them a lot there. Glenn, what would you like to do? Um, I am... Can I gauge per chance? And if no, that's fine. How does this guy look? This dude in front of me. Is he look beat or is he so like he's such a strange creature to my like points of like reference, uh, right? Reference that he's like just un unattainable information. Well I'm so glad you, you asked me. If you see the yellow ring or the green ring, that resembles how yeah. healthy they are. I will okay. say it's really hard to tell, but you did see Arnholt give that wailing onto him with his rapier, and you surmise that this guy would be the weakest. Okay, yeah, I'm going to go ahead, and I am going to swing on him, and uh, I am going to go ahead and call, well, actually, hold on, oops, where is it, where are we, you hit the okay, yeah, I'm going to roll to hit this fellow, I'm just going to do it for another swing, uh, I don't know why that didn't take, let's try it again, oh, it did, never mind, oh, did I roll a nat 20? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't like give you the noise, so I did. I, I did I roll a nat twenty? <laughs> yeah, you did. Well, yeah. like I didn't. Uh, the, whenever I rolled the first time, it didn't like take. I couldn't see it. But yeah. When I rolled the second time, I saw both. So hey, it was well. You got it, man. Okay, cool. So what's our what's our nat twenty rules? Is it just like you the roll nat double twenty or rule, or you roll twice? The nat twenty rule is you roll once, and then we duplicate the total amount of dice you could have rolled. So for instance, <laughs> you were gonna do with your first attack at least. Okay. 24 damage. Alright, so that is a 12, I, I miscalculated, that is a 12 plus a 9, so you will have dealt 21 points of slashing damage. Is that the guy right below you? Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. Nice. As you hit him with that uh, massive whack, you watch as his right shin goes out, he actually, hobbles to the ground it, before it, he goes it, back is, to his feet. Is it too late 
for me to call a divine smite. Um, Pump it in, man. Pump no, it in. no, because it, it it hit. Um, okay. So yeah, you can you can yeah. call it. And then and that, that new is question: Is it um, is it an undead creature? It is indeed. Like, is it considered undead? Okay, yes. Okay, cool. Hell yeah. So, that's so you two, get an extra eight. whatever. And by the way, are you attacking him twice or just once? Just the once. Okay. Good the second roll was next. All right, roll your divine smite damage. Okay. Wow. Six. And then that's doubled too, isn't it? Because it's a crit. Um, no, you wouldn't crit divine smite damage, because uh, it, because it's added on later. Um, but let's so see that's here. what Matthew Mercer does. Fuck Matthew. Yeah, yeah, they do it. <laughs> you, uh, it's like sneak attack. You double the dice. Yeah. You double the dice. So it'd huh? be, it'd be six plus what is that? Two d eight. So six plus sixteen. Hold on, hold on, hold on. For our crit rule. It, it's two d six, by the way. That's why I'm having a difficulty calculating this. Okay, that's twenty one <laughs> plus six. That's twenty seven. And he's undead, so it would deal even. It, would it deal double damage since he's undead? Uh, well, I get to add an extra d eight. Oh, go ahead and roll your Which actually, I didn't even do that. I just rolled a yeah, D8. Yeah, go ahead and roll your D8. So yeah, I got another D8 to roll there. And then all of it doubled. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, Aww. there we go. 14 extra. Not quite enough, but a Shit. massive blow that knocks his right knee off. It takes this creature a while to get back to his feet. But as he does, he stares right at Glenn. Damn, the two ones, what a shame. That's my turn. Okay. Alistair, as you witness this take place, what do you want to do? I am going to come back here to Aurelis. And I'm going to cast Cure Wounds. Oh. Okay. Is it my turn? With that, Alistair. Oh, rather, Aralas, you come back alive and you guys watch as a breath enters his lungs once again. Thank you so much. Is that your turn? Um. No. Actually, what I'm going to do for my bonus action, I'm going to cast Sanctuary on Glenn. Glenn, you don't know where it comes from, but suddenly you feel ever more confident in this fight. Okay. Is that your turn? Yes, it does. Alright, up next, this last Cold Light Walker. Let's see what his range is like. He's gonna kill me! He's gonna kill me! Oh, dude, how did this fight go so wrong so quick? Okay. As he marches his way, 5, 10, 15, you watch. Oh, he can't even go up there. He's going to just turn right here as he's going to try to eke out a ray right onto Captain Davies and Aralas. As the cold ray comes out. Does an will, 18 uh, hit either of you? It does for me. Uh, can I reaction cast shield? Yes. Then no, it doesn't. Oh, is... All right. Okay, so shield would work with the. With wow. The uh, it's a reaction. Yeah, shield as well on my side then. As you go to extend shield, Aralas, you flinch as you realize Alistair's already done it for you. As he casts shield, it blocks the ray from ever entering. And you guys are completely safe and sound. Until the other Cold Light Walker's turn, who is right now. And he is going to do the same thing as, uh... Well, let's see, actually, here. Yeah, Rez. Yep. Okay. The Connect 4 I've ever seen. As he runs up, first thing he does, slam attack right on the Glen. Glen does an 18 hit. Well, I put Sanctuary on Glenn. Doesn't he have to make a Wisdom check? Oh, that's right. Well, well, he doesn't have to make a Wisdom check, but um, he does have plus 5 AC. So, Glenn, I think that would miss you. 
Uh, is that what Sanctuary does? Yeah, you have no. plus okay. five AC. Oh, no. wait, no, that's shield. No. My bad. No, Sanctuary, he yeah. has to make okay. a wisdom saving throw. My bad, yeah, I was reading the wrong spell. DC 14. Okay. He can either attack Arnholt and be fine. All right, he fails that. So I'm going to say that uses his attack. He's going to circle around yada yada yada, which is going to take an opportunity attack from Arnholt. Arnholt, come on. Arnholt misses as Arnholt whiffs through the air. No! The Cold Light Walker raises his hand again. And Rez. You are once again unconscious. Yep, there goes my one hit point. Ooh. Aralas, as you wait, are wait, back wait, wait. alive. Wait, 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 how much was the total damage? You really want to know that? Uh, yeah. the total damage was 28. I'm dead. Rez is dead. Alright. As Rez like, no, is... Like, no, hey, I don't mean unconscious. That reaches my hit point maximum. Yep. I am dead. You're right. Do you have, uh, do you have absor absorb elements? Are you kidding me? If you do have absorb elements as a reaction, you can half the cult. I, I don't have anything like that. That's right. I have absorbed elements, but that's only self, isn't it? Yeah, and plus you've already used your reaction. So, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was good playing Rez. Time to play my next character. Cool. As the cold damage infects Rez, striking him down, you guys watch as Rez's body instantly turns completely ice solid. As ice covers his skin and his torso, he is a hunking chunk of iceberg. And that is going to end their turn. Aralas, what do you want to do? Seeing this happening, I'm going to be very, very angry. I'm going to bonus action. Uh, I'll take the, the, the shadow blade out. Bonus action. I'll use half my movement to stand up. And uh, oh, I'll... Oh, uh, wait a minute. Rez. Yeah. He did 28 damage, but you had 1 HP. That means he would have done 27, so you're not dead. Had he done one <laughs> more point of damage, oh, Rez would no longer be a character. Retconning so. all of that, Rez is beaten into the ground suddenly and does not freeze. He is still an organic mush of gore. Aralas, what do you want to do? Um, okay, okay, okay. Um, since the creature stayed in the burning oil, it should take five fire damage the oil is not on fire it is not then yeah. i will yeah, my turn was going to be to shoot it yeah 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 i will i will i will i will i will i will create a bonfire below actually no i want to I'll, I'll i'll bonus action i'll do what i wanted to do Okay. Uh, bonus action, Shadow Blade. I'll step in. Uh, so I only have 15 feet of movement. I think I'm going to go here. And I don't want to have an opportunity attack, so I'll attack the beast. Shadow Blade, Elven Accuracy. Uh, Shadow Blade, so triple advantage. Ooh. So we only take the, tr the first tree. 25 to hit. Yes, sir. 13 psychic damage. Which one is that on? The bottom one. How do you want to do this? I'll just slice uh, from the head to the elbow, or just just slice a big chunk, and I'll turn <laughs> around watching the other one. As you guys hear a massive slash and a wicking of fabric, you watch as the head is separated and hits the snow. As it does, that lingering blue light dissipates, and it becomes just a resting skull in the snowy tundra. And I will take a position here where is Ray would affect nobody else but me. That's right. And, uh, end of turn. Rez, roll me a death saving throw. I'm so glad I caught that. I was looking at it and I was like, wait a minute. 28 minus 1 is not 28. Okay, that... It's a good catch. Dude, literally I would, 1. I would... It's a GM roll, but when we watch this video again, <laughs> you guys will see. Um, 
Okay, good roll, Res. Otaku. You are still alive in the land of the living. What do you want to do? Me, um... The body's not looted, right? Well, there's but still I, one I, alive. I, there's still one, yeah, yeah, I see now. Um, I go in one, two, walk close ten feet. And then... Let me see what I, what I still have in my inventory. <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing. Freezing weapon used once a day. Um... Does he know this? You get sneak because we're beside him. Yep. Yeah, okay. That's yeah, what I asked. Like, yeah, I was gonna ask, does he know my existence? He does indeed. But sneak attack is not a result of necessarily stealth. You can activate sneak attack even though you're not stealthed. Okay. I'm yeah, gonna... as long as you have, like, as long as you're hidden or you have friends that are engaged with an enemy, you mm -hmm. get sneak attack. Anywhere yeah. that you get, like, advantage on your attack. On your first attack, you get it. You get your sneak attack. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna perform a sneak attack on him with my dagger. Okay, um, you can't quite get to him where you are, but if you ran here, you could. Can I just like do a like a wall run and just like stab it in the back? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me an acrobatics check. We'll see how you can how well you can sneak in there. Not one, baby. Oh shit. Alright, you can't quite do it, but as you get to here, and you whack into the wall embarrassingly and hit your noggin up against the rocks, you do notice that it's only about a 10 feet climb. You, you could climb that, Otaku. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna climb that. Alright, using all of your movement, you get to the top, and as you get right here, <laughs> you can shoot him, or you can jump down. It's up to you. Yeah, um, so that's all my movements, right? 25 feet? Yeah, One, two, but, yeah but if you jump time. off the top, I'm not going to reduce your movement. Okay, yeah, I'm going to jump off and, like, sink my dagger into his spine that's exposed okay. in front of the outside. As you guys watch Otaku scaling this mountain like a chameleon, his head then turns back and he leaps off. As you reduce your grip on the wall and grab this cold light walker, your first attack is a miss. Go ahead with your second attack. Natural 20. And plus 1d6, right? Uh, well, your sneak attack at 4th level, hold on. Or oh, 1d8. You also give it yourself. No, it's d6s. Also, I love how, Gasper, you got a... On both of those rolls, one's a crit, one's a fail. That's right. I'm Typical gas for fashion. Not one and not twenty. So you have two d6 as a sneak attack. So click the word dagger, and then roll two d6. Click the dagger again. In chat. Oh, in chat. Oh. That's how you display damage. Nice. So that is not nine damage. That is actually eleven damage, and then roll two d6. That'd be an extra 17 damage, if that's doubled, like, on a crit. Uh, we've never doubled sneak attack damage before on a crit, but uh, I'll look into it later and see if, see about making it a rule. Uh, but for the time being, that is 11 plus 5, 16 in total. Does that end your turn? Yes, that ends my turn. I got nowhere to go. I'm out of movements. All right. Well, that's a good turn, and you will be uh, right here on top of the Cold Eye Walker. As we begin Glenn's turn. Glenn, what do you want to do? Um, I'm just going to bop, get close to him, get within my melee range, and make another uh, fucking scimitar attack. Bing, bing, boom. Uh, there we go. All right, as you utilize Scath Scimitar, you bring it down. I'm going to use another is. Divine Smite gonna call that now so there's 13 plus three and then there's another three d eight on top of that i just realized 19. i just realized since gasper is technically crossing the plane that is going to be a critical hit because uh, you will have flanking advantage i can draw a line between them that is a <laughs> crazy technicality but yeah so oh. 25 damage <laughs> Plus 19 Divine Smite. 
Damn. Which, which is undead, so go ahead and roll me... Un oh, you no, already I, rolled I, that. I already rolled the extra, yeah, yeah. Man, you're making me do a lot of math here, but altogether, <laughs> that is a total of 40... Four piercing damage. That is the record oh. for this game so far. Let's go. As you, the best character. As you smash him in the shoulder, you watch as his clavicle just collapses. As he falls to the ground for but a moment, the cold light walker stands back up. Does that end your turn? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that is my turn. Two natural 20 so far for Glenn, and they are still standing. Alistair, what do you want to do? I'm going to hit him with my blunderbuss. That it's? Five piercing and damage. Unlucky roll, but as you blast a huge <laughs> hole into his robes, what else would you like to do? Uh, I'm checking my bonus actions. Out of Eldritch Shaman Make one of these. here. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, that's the end of my turn. All right. What the fuck is going on? Windows updater, get out of here. Okay. What will be the Cold Light Walker's final move? Shedding this very bright light, you watch as he puts his hands down to his shoulders, almost like an isosceles triangle, absorbing the cold light energy all around him, and then dispels it out of his face. <laughs> As he leers down, and you guys hear this audible tone once again. Let's see here. I'm gonna say, just for the purposes of this, Gasper, go ahead and give me a dexterity saving throw. Okay. Dexterity. Alright. Gasper, as you fall to the ground in front, <laughs> right between Glenn, both of you are hit with this cold ray. Glenn, is Sanctuary still active? Um, oh no, if I attack it, uh, remove Sanctuary. Okay. Yeah. As you guys watch this die. ray of cold energy shoot forth, Glenn is blown off of his feet, and as he lands in the snow, you guys see a searing hole in his chest. That is 21 cold damage. You are unconscious on the ground. And with that, you guys watch as Otaku <laughs> is blown off as well. You guys have never seen Otaku take this much damage before, but instead of dissipating into his stone, you guys watch as he too is felled on the ground, also unconscious. Yeah. Fine. Aralas. How much damage I took? You took 21 cold damage. I'm dead. You're actually not, because uh, you didn't roll for uh, levels 3 or 4 HP. So we'll do that. We'll do that right now. Go ahead and roll two d eight. That'd be good. Not three d eight. Two d eight. Oh. All right. Ooh. I'm just one you, away. You are dead. As Otaku's essence. Wait, is, is he actually like legit dead? Yeah, he's dead. As Otaku's essence <laughs> disappears, so does his body. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I'm sorry, but what? How did, how did two ran like two fucking skeletons in coats come up what? and just destroy <laughs> our <laughs> whole party? Rez, go ahead and roll me a death saving throw. Well, I know what, I know what his next character is gonna be. Hey, what, is this my turn before Rez? Um. Oh yeah, I'm sorry about that, Aralas. What did, what do you want to do? Okay. Uh. Seeing all of this happen all at the same time, there was snow in my face, guys. What is happening? Fuck! I'll uh, s sorry, my dwarf friend. I'm not gonna be an asshole to you when you're down like this, and I'm gonna feed Rez a potion of healing. Okay. <laughs> so, did we say we use an action or a bonus action for those? Well, even. If even if it did require a bonus action, you are still administering and using the help action. So unfortunately, that will be your turn. Okay, that's perfect. 2d4 plus 2 How for much you. you? Um, Rez, this. You, you can roll it, Rez, since you are the one consuming it. Yeah. Okay, uh, roll 2d4 
plus two. All right. Hey. With your six HP, Aralas, you still have a bonus action and your movement left. Yeah, so I'm gonna get back in my square from on top of Glen. And the bonus action, bonus action, bonus action. What does this character do? I think at this point, everybody's gonna need a serious nap. So, um. I don't have a lot. <coughs> I'm going to. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to scream at the beast. My uh, friend, you are an asshole, and I have so many healing potions that if you don't try to kill me first, you will be here all night or day. So I will uh, seriously intimidate him very well. That's what you get with a French uh, accent. That's a good intimidation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dude, you, sh you showed him, man. Oh, he must be quivering in his boot. At you the same stop. time, bonus action, blade singing, so more AC. And that's my turn. You know, it's so hard to imitate Aralus when he isn't here, but with a role like that, you know the real Aralus is in the building. <laughs> up next, Otaku. Well, wait, wait, wouldn't it be my turn I'm, now since I'm well, actually up? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm fucking the turn order up all kinds of ways. Rez, go ahead. Since you are now alive, what do you want to do? Okay, so for the first time in this combat, I can actually do something on my turn. So I'm going to bend down to Glenn, and of course I'm going to cast Cure Wounds at second level. God bless. So you get 13 hit points, Woo. and I am... Bop. 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 And I am... I'm moving. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'll move... Instead of there, I'll move next to my brother. Okay. And, and that'll be my turn. Rez, I thought you were okay. Oh, things change out here all the time, don't you know? Now, go in there and fight something. Yes, absolutely. Otaku. As yes. peace and serenity washes over your body. You find yourself in that village, that town that you first came to Icewind Dale in, surrounded by your friends, the gnomes, and the others in your initial company. You think back on your long life, and you guys witness, for but a moment, this apparition appears, blue and celestial in nature, the true visage of the Dragonborn Otaku. And as you look about your group of friends struggling for survival, you have enough time to say one sentence. What will that be? <laughs> what, are, what are Otaku's last words, Gasper? Uh, fuck you, Cody Walker. <laughs> <laughs> As he disappears once again, a life yeah, ended in the way that it lived. That's right. Glenn, what would you like to do? Um, <coughs> I am deeply upset by the loss of our intermittent uh, dragonborn friend. I will take, of course, half a minute to stand up, but I am immediately... Uh, standing, and as I'm rising, I'm gonna swing up on this cold by walker. Um, and I always lose the game here. Let's make that roll. Bam. Fuck. Um, oh, we haven't buried in this fight at all. We're Earth one. That's right. Yeah, they probably they probably suffocated long ago. Yeah, they're probably all dead too. Now you Everyone's do have dead. you do have another attack. I are we level five? Uh oh no, I th I thought you had two attacks at level three. No, I don't get that to level five. Okay, does that end your turn? Um, let's see, who else close to him is Arlos? Um, Taku's corpse is under him. Uh, just to. 
move the line, I'm gonna step right there. Okay. And that's my turn. Alistair Davies, what would you like to do? Uh, witnessing the death of a somewhat companion. <laughs> An acquaintance. Um, a near acquaintance. and dear acquaintance. A guy who was there sometime. <laughs> Uh, my favorite dragonborn. Uh, I'm going to look at the cold light walker. Damn you to la vistas. I'm gonna fire my blunderbuss. Without the cold light walker. <laughs> As its undead jaw unhinges for a second at the sound of the name, the blunderbuss hits. Roll for damage. Ah! Good rolls, good rolls. Alistair, how do you want to do this? Let's go. So you said it, it's jaw unhinged at the name Levistus. Yep, and as soon as that impact touched it, it's jaw unhinged and fell all the <laughs> way to the ground. I'm, I'm just jabbing my gun in its mouth and just blowing every bit of it to hell. Okay. As this explosion rings out the end of combat, you guys see as the bone fragments linger to the ground, these two frostbite victims have been felled. But they're not the only ones. Frostbite victims? As a matter of oh, fact, shit. Glenn, you know that's exactly what they are. Over their bodies, black sores and, and pieces of skin accumulate. You can see where Portions of their flesh have rotted off to expose bare bone like their skulls and spines. These are definitely the victims of frostbite, and they seem to have been dead for quite a while. I'm gonna collect their bones and skulls. Or I guess one skull. We gotta find Larry. I, I think I was trying to find Larry like right when all this shit <coughs> broke out. That is true, and with your high perception, you can go back to the spot of where she was, as you do so, Rez, if you want to. Yeah, I want to. I want to find. I want to find Larry, and I, I. I pull over her steel defender at this point, and I'm like, Larry, come here. Her steel come defender's nowhere to be seen. But as you did roll a high perception, as you draw now to the place at where she is, you can see the steel defender is quickly at work digging a huge hole. It's about five feet deep right now, and he is still going, or she. I, I get down there and I start I start helping. Go ahead and give me a, an athletics check. Alistair's uh, mourning over the frozen corpse of Ooh. Otaku. Um, did I see where Is the stone was thrown? Um, you did. The stone will be right here. Wait, what? it Is doesn't make sense. Is there a corpse of Otaku? He threw the stone that way. No, it doesn't make sense. I am the stone, so if I die, my stone would be with me over there. Well, the stone is a uh, belonging of Larry's, and your essence, your spirit, was once contained oh. inside of it. That's right. With that, Rez, you inevitably uncover Larry. As she breaks three... <gasps> Oh, hi, Ariel. Uh, what did I miss? Uh, your imaginary friend might be a little more imaginary than you'd like now. What do you mean by that? He's not a... Oh, no. Something happened to Otaku? Yeah, and because of, I don't know how long she was really down there, uh, I'm going to cast another Cure Wounds on her, and then one on myself. So one at first level for her, and one at second level for me. <laughs> one for you, two for me. Oh, thank you. Exactly. Even though you are both healed now, um, she at full health, you both have one point of exhaustion from the snowy avalanche, which woke you up. Aralas, That's fair. Aralas, you, Alistair, and Glenn are okay. You either rolled high enough or don't have to succumb to the disadvantages. Glenn. As you kneel down and pick up the stone, you watch as the rune 
flickering with blue light dissipates. Uh, so, like, <laughs> there's no body. There's, like, no remains. It's just nothing. I think we're at a point where only a wish spell would bring him back. Oh my None God. of us, we don't have a cleric. None of us have, are yeah, say, I have able... Nothing. Yeah, none of us are able to bring back the dead, especially even if we had a class that could. We don't. We aren't even high enough level. Like there, if we get high, really high level, and we wish to bring Otaku back, nah, then we could. But just, just so we're all clear, and we do this the right way, because I want to make sure the first player death is official. Ralas does have a spell scroll of true resurrection. However, a requirement for that spell. Is a body. Damn. Plus, oh it is a very complex a different race. Oh my god. Should have, should have picked a different race. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. These oh. two skeletons just came out of nowhere and fucked us all. <laughs> so fucking hard. So, my friends, I'm gonna use right. the oil to cast a bonfire so it. It's gonna cast a lot of heat on us for the meanwhile, so if yes. anybody needs it. Jasper, what's it like, kind of like oh. being MIA for a while, and like coming back and being like, I'm so excited to play Dungeons and Dragons. It's and your be first so game nice. is died. <laughs> and, you and then you die the, the session you come back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was oh, think no. I was going through that like this after I died. I was like, I've been going through like. I skip a month and came back on the session. I try to enjoy the game and then I die. <laughs> and to be I fair, to Gaffer, you and I were yep. almost in the same. You and I were almost in the same same boat. I was one damage away from also being truly dead. That I spell, was one damage away being alive. Guys, that spell that <laughs> killed you initially, Res, was four d six. It rolled a six, a five, a six. And a one. <laughs> what the fuck? That's that's what five happens. Five d six. On, and all on that, a natural and all that 20. was doubled because it was a nat twenty. Yeah. That was a trip. Astounding. That was almost a TPK. I went down. That's the first time I've gone down. I know. Down. Yes, Bar, you could have a bonus action um, disengaged and get away from it, hoping not to get a straight line attack. But nah, there was no, no way to plan this one. <laughs> I don't think I had it. I mean, my disengage was, wouldn't get me far enough. Mm. As Larry, oh yeah, the movement, yeah. As Larry quickly gets in her steel defender, and Ariel rushes her back, you guys see the small kobold hop out of the metal chassis. Where is it? Where's my rock? I slowly approach her, and I um, hold it out in my palm with the section of the room like faced up to show that it's like no longer glowing. You watch as she traces the rune with her fingertips. Why is it? Why is he? Why isn't it working? What happened? Uh, we're very sorry, Larry. I come up to Larry and I just gesture at the, the two corpses of the undead thing. He turned into skeletons. Yeah, he turned into a skeleton and then, <laughs> and then just died. Yeah. <laughs> He turned into two skeletons and just died. It was pretty I didn't weird. Say that actually. So. No, <laughs> no, no. Obviously not. No. That was, that was pretty funny though. That was pretty funny though. <laughs> no, anyway, I just gestured to the skeletons, implying that that's what what happened. There's only <coughs> one thing we can do for him now. We gotta, we gotta take him back to my mom. Oh. To your, to your mom, your, with your, your with mother. Your, yeah, by all means, enlighten us, because we, we've been, I've been in a silent panic, trying to figure. You know, out how something we tells me that Larry, something tells me that Larry isn't actually all here right now, so we should wait <laughs> to talk to her about this. Let's give Larry some time to process. <laughs> okay, yeah, give it time to process. Thank you. Thanks. As you guys make your way back, you do see another figure lingering on the cliffside. A sea elf, with a small yeti on his shoulder, is looking straight up into the sky. 
guys, we have got to do something about this guy. I, I like know, he's just... Thing. Yeah, like how, how's, how's the storm? The storm has dissipated. You guys still cannot see outside of a 100-foot diameter. Only 100 foot in any direction. But it has dissipated substantially. Okay, put the tent back up and, just, and take another rest before we have to fold it all up again. At about that time, you guys see Erland as he races down the cliff face and begins heading back to the camp. Before he gets there, would anyone like to do anything? Uh, I don't think so. As he gets back, he puts Tiger on the ground. Look! Look up! I look up. As you guys do so, you see a massive 50-foot tall with a 60-foot wingspan. Yep. This huge white owl with a beak and gnarled, twisted horns that eclipse each side of its head. As it flies by, its head snaps <laughs> quickly as it looks down at all of you. <laughs> and the owl takes off. The hell was that? They have words for her where I am from. And they would be? Sal Kuruk. She is the Frost Maiden. That was her? The one we've been hearing about this entire time? Yes. <clears throat> Sal Kuruk. Okay. Well, we need to get to Kirkonig. We need a place to, like, actually rest. So let's take a short rest. Everyone can get back up on their feet. I have discovered something else. Look. And as he points down the cliff line, you guys can see the open face of a cave. Erland rolled a little what? bit higher on his survival check than either of you. God damn it. What? what? <clears throat> Why didn't we go there last night? Anyways, let's take a rest in the cave after we pack up the tent. I'll be honest, didn't see it. Just did not see it. It's I will still put the tent in your bag. I'll start putting the material and equipment in my bag after I've dumped all the bones in there. Portable year. <laughs> As you guys inevitably clean up, some of you even decide to go throughout the belongings of these dead skeletons in which you find nothing. As you guys gather everything up and make your way to the cave, you settle in for a night's rest. Aralas, would you like to use your campfire ability? Yes, I would. I, it would be my pleasure to bring some heat in this cold, sad, long resting time. As you light up the cave space with the fire, you guys are startled as you look around. For surrounding you in this cave are six dead bodies. Blackened skin, exposed skeletal fragments. These appear to be more frostbite victims. I poke one of them. Falls over really in rigor good. mortis. Okay. I, I start throwing them outside the cave <laughs> one after the other after the other Arnholt fate and as he leans down he plucks an amulet from one of their necks it's the same amulet that he once wore the like crystals the ice star or whatever and as he throws it to the ground and breaks it with the heel of his boot that's where we'll leave off until the next morning. As you guys inevitably wake up after what is essentially 12 hours of rest, you guys all have full health, full spell slots, completely healed, and it is now high noon. It's high noon. As you guys rub off the decay of sleep and shake yourselves awake, where would you guys like to go? Uh, we need to go to Kerkonig, don't we? Yeah, I think just continue in the direction of Kerkonig. And you do so. 
and you have a relatively uneventful trip. Some more snowy rabbits lingering in the distance let you know, Glenn, that you're getting closer. And as you get to a fork in the path, you know that you need to take a right to go to Kerkonic. If you take a left here, it'll take you to the Dwarven Valley. Okay, I just motion everyone uh, head to the right. As you do so, you guys inevitably coalesce right outside of your helpless home of Kerkonic. As you guys look out now, it is a very different kind of city, slept in the valley, right off the vicinity of the Dwarven Valley itself. It is gathered on both sides by the steep, slate-like surface of um, the massive mountain, Kelvin's Cairn, which is right outside the vicinity. And on the other side, the Loch Dinnishire. As you guys approach now to the gate, you can see a number of dwarves outside the vicinity. Not very clothed, which is quite surprising. They have massive red searing tattoos etched into their bulbous musculature skin. As they hail the guards and head inside, you guys are up next. Oh, hey, how's it going? You guys letting yeah. just anybody in these days? Hey. Actually, actually hey. hold on, hold on. I think maybe it's better than I. Glenn, uh, you, yeah, I didn't you say, take the lead I didn't here. Say that to them. I, I was like running that by Glenn. Like, oh, is that good? Should I say that? <laughs> sure. That would be super good if I were any. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, fellas. Okay, um, you, you take the lead. You take the lead. <laughs> I'm, I'm Glenn. Glenn Connick, uh, son of, son of Eglinda. Um, may myself and my compatriots, uh, please. Uh, make entrance. A very familiar dwarf looks on you. His name is Therendir, and he's guarded these gates since you were a little boy. Hi, Mr. Konek. Welcome home. Thank you much. It's been, how's the how's gate duty working out for you? Still good? Oh, you know, just the shittiest profession a fellow can ask for out here, but I'm holding myself together. What about you? Sailing? Give you any fortunes? Uh, not so much fortunes. Lots of trauma. Is that anything? Yeah, well, everything's currency if you know how to spend it. Now, welcome in. And by the way, next time you're in that tavern of yours, why don't you tell your father to uh, forget me tab? I would love. You know Wait. what? I'll run that by him. Thank you. As are we like being let in at this point? You absolutely are. Okay, I look over to to Glenn, <coughs> and I say, "Your dad owns a tavern." He does actually. He does a pretty pretty popular one around here. Um, I figure maybe that's where we're head first. Uh, of course, I would love to meet your father. Of course. And I'm sure he'd love to meet all of you. You've got all that coin on you, right? Of course, I don't go anywhere without coin. Perfect, he'll love you. Sat is really like, is the coolest thing ever. We should close it right away. I know. Let's go to a tavern. Hopefully tab on the house. As you guys make your way in, <laughs> someone's house. there's a castle, just like the one at Caridin of all, except it's destroyed, covered in rubble. As you walk by now, the place where the dwarves rebelled against their landowners and destroyed the castle in the process, you guys make your way past a very wide log house, beautifully sheened, teal shingles atop, and a still bellowing chimney of soot. You know this to be the speaker's house, Glenn. And as you walk by, you guys take the full slope around this arcing crescent-shaped village, and at the end, there is a massive pub with a lingering line of happy patrons and a single blue lingering lamplight. And where is that on the map? It is right here. Hook, line, and sinker. Hell yeah, baby. After you, Glenn. Let's... I have never been so excited for anything in my life, if I'm being quite honest. As you all get in line. Oh, Glenn, I think you're talking to yourself. You're muted. 
and then you remuted yourself. Fuck it. You're back. Oh fuck! Now the DM is muted. You're Everyone's back. Muted. You're back, Glenn. Have a lot of emotion in the air. I can feel it. <laughs> Aralas, as you <laughs> gather with this human changeling, your human pirate captain, and this soon-to-be drunken dwarf, you all get your places oh, in line. Hey. I'm half elven right now. I'm still in my usual half elven form. Okay, half elven. I apologize. As you gather in another half elven woman. Tawny skinned with blonde braids that hang over her shoulders, you know her to be your father's assistant, Lunara. As she walks the line, Odin, who hasn't had the hook? Hook's going up, hook going twice. At which point, uh, it's. Oh, I'll take one. All right. It's so excited. As she comes by and she already has a huge chalice full of honey mead that is made locally on the premises, not any of that other shit. She fills it up to the brim and gives out the hook, the first drink of the night. As she hands one to each of you, Arnholt is already lip deep with a very frothy, foamy mustache. And Glenn, as she hands it to you. Now say, you must be from round here. I am, I am actually. Um, is my father in? He is, most certainly. You know... They don't make handsome dwarves like yourself nowadays. <laughs> and she I don't hands think they make handsome dwarves at all. She hands you a glass, and as she waves her hand around her, that'll be on the house. She points to the other custodians who are helping her man the front of the bar. And with that, a few people look back and smile. And then at the front, the very last people in line, you can see three sailors. Anchor tattoos spider web gathers on one fellow's neck as it stretches from ear to ear and a third <laughs> is donned in a brown robe but you can tell he's very muscular as they look back these guys are badass oh guess we're not good enough for free drinks oh james yeah and the three of them head in as the line ushers forward you guys get closer and closer to the line lunara disappears inside that tavern once more as the line etches forward a little bit more, it is now your turn. As you guys, the last in line, more people have gathered behind you. And as you're about to go in, is there anything you would like to do? Last minute preparation. I make sure my mustache is pristine. Like all my facial hair, my regular hair. I'm I'm going in looking nice. This is this has been a while since I've seen my father. Been a while since I've been in this space. Honestly, I'm surprised how oh. many people remember me. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. I didn't know you had any family. You literally never talked about it. It's not come up. Um, it should go well. If anyone has any questions or any concerns, feel free to ask me. I'll buy drinks. Just no, no, Glenn, I got it. As you okay. all step in. Oh, may, may I ask? Uh, how welcome are we in this town? Is it, uh, are we, should we expect anything to go wrong or is the family mood in the best situation? You have uh, heard murmurings of, of a Duragar <laughs> infestation, but aside from what from you can see, this looks like the most welcoming, kind, and loving town you've seen, well, since leaving Brinchander. This is great, okay, I'll follow along. As you guys walk in, the first thing that you smell is that scent of old mildewy <coughs> ale. But that smell is quite a pleasant surprise to you as you guys look around, drinks at every table. On the walls, there is decorative shale scar, bones of whales and other aquatic wildlife that have been carved intricately and used as patterns, almost like a very complicated system of bony wallpaper. As you guys walk in, a white-skinned dwarf with a black, bushy beard, black hair that trails down to his shoulders, completely bald on top. He adjusts his spectacles. Oh, you've had the hook. Now how about the lie? So, my son's not dead after all. Closer than I was before I left, but not quite. Well, it's not like anyone here would have known anything different. On account of you never writing home. 
not not a whole lot of places to ship mail out on the sea. But that is you, underneath that beard and funny hat. Yeah, under underneath the pageantries of sea life, I am still Glenn. Good. And I give him a hug. He reciprocates. <laughs> oh my boy, it's been too oh. long. Oof. As he holds you in tightly. You know that beard's looking pretty good on you. You almost look like your mother. <laughs> you really you think it's you think it's as full as hers? It's been Hey. You've got quite the daisy wisp on you, fella. <laughs> now then what do I pay the bard here for if he's not playing any music when my son comes home? At about the time Oh, the you corner, need someone to play music? Sure. And I, I look around to see if there's either anyone about to play or if there's a designated place to play that I can set up and, and start playing. Or if there's already a musician playing, I want to join up with him, not battle him. I just want to hop in on what he's doing. There's not, but there is a man nice. fully regaled in green and purple minstrel garb who is completely unconscious and drunker than hell. He's got dried, mildewy ale all around him. Okay, yeah. So I... Is there, like, a small stage area? Or, or not? There actually is. There's a small stoop on the western side. It's really a platform for people to know not to stand in front of the kitchen doors. But you could stand up there and gather a court, if you so wish. Yeah, that's what I want to do. I, I, I bend down to Larry, and I, I hand her my hat as my usual... Uh, hat monkey and I and, and then I, I start playing all, all my all my tunes I start playing some lively fun ones some good drinking ones uh, I, I start playing some songs that I, I've, I've picked up in some of the other taverns you know I, I try to really do a performance and I in between songs I try to wave down a, a waitresses and waiters and try to get drinks in between rounds progressively getting more sweaty and you do lunara comes up and services you gives you whatever you'd like glenn as you know you guys have already had the hook that very sweet tasting mead like ale now it's time for the line as your bartending father gets behind the counter he mixes a few drinks and pushes them out you guys know these to be a silver splint sunset a seaside daiquiri a, um, a dwarvish quarter leg spiced with cinnamon, and finally classic dwarvish quarter leg, just the way most people like it. As you guys are each given these four drinks, there are 16 taggards placed on the bar in front of you. And as your father clears another glass, uh, it's so good to have you home. I'd like to talk to you about a few things if you've got time. Of course, of course. Real quick, before we get to this, uh, anything that might be serious, I have a few points of order that have just come up since I've been in town. Uh, what was the name, real quick, Garrett? The the name of that person running the gate? I forgot. I didn't write it down. Um, that's okay. That would be Faranmir. Sorry. Faranmir? Faranmir, yeah. T-H-E-R-E-N-M-I-I-R. Faranmir. Gotcha. Uh, real quick, just since I've been here, Theramir, does he have a tab running here right now? Uh, not at all. I give him all his drinks for free. You give him all of his drinks for free? Well, then what the hell is he complaining to me about? Oh, he's giving you all the time. Um, his wife passed away just the other night. Oh, Jesus. She got lost on top of the cairn. She went out there with an expeditionary team. and Well, when you don't come back from the cairn, it's likely she's taken. Now, let's start here. Your friends, I, I want to know them. Uh, friends, absolutely, let me introduce you. First off, the, the flat boy is playing the instruments. That there is Rez Tholomew. He's a treat. Uh, he can be a bit much, and some of us pretend that we don't like him. He's honestly a lot of fun. Uh, I think really, so. really brings an energy to the group. This here, pointing to the sea up, this is our last. He and I actually don't get to spend too much time together. Not on purpose. He's also a treasure. 
I would do anything for this man. Uh, I am a great person, uh, very skilled with the sword, but nothing like my friend Glenn that you are uh, talking with. Well, if you are friends with my son, then you're a friend of mine. Welcome, Master Elf. Thank I you so much. To, I point to Larry. Uh, did, is there Steel Defender like in here? <laughs> you can see the Steel Defender locomoting and shooting off steam from the stablery outside as he's tied to one of the stirrups. Okay, gotcha. But also, Larry is actively running <laughs> up and down, collecting money in my hat. Oh, that's right. That there is Larry. Uh, groups. Uh, she's a real tinkerer. A lot of fun. She's actually got a, uh, a, a uh, steel golem that she seems to connect with. He's outside. They're outside. Um, don't mind them. Promise they're harmless. Right. Uh, That's the smallest dragonborn I've ever laid eyes upon. She's got a condition, I think. I think. Um, I point to Erland. Uh, this here, he is very interesting. Uh, he we picked him up last, which I was second to last, so that means something. Um, he uh, really likes stars, trees, and a yeti that he carries around in a backpack. Yeti's also harmless. A yeti, you say? Oh yeah, it's right here. You you want me to show him to you? Uh, no. Uh, there's a fella in town who once kept a yeti. <laughs> Didn't go too well. Well, this one's cool. I swear to you. Um, and this here... This here is Alistair. I served with him uh, several times uh, out on the sea. He uh, is apparently a captain now, which is very exciting. Um, I mean, not now, maybe, but he was. Uh, he is absolutely wonderful. I hope you all spent a lot of time together. Uh, he's probably going to keep a bit to himself. He's been through a bit recently. Captain Davies. Well, Captain Alistair, it's uh, nice to meet you. Hi. You run a nice tavern. Thanks, sir. Uh, Forgive me for not being in the heart for drinking tonight. Oh, I understand. It will always be on the house. Complimentary service and all. Also, kind of leans in. You might want to keep it to yourself. You're a captain. Plenty of dwarves in here want to marry their daughters off to some rich, well-to-do seaman. Marrying daughters isn't of my sort. <laughs> hey, that's why we dwarves call it a bonding ceremony. Two souls becoming one. Well, it's been a long time since uh, I knew a love like your mother's, but now that you're here, Glenn, I'm glad once again. At about which point he goes to cleaning a glass. Say, uh, do you know those fellers in the corner? Yeah, uh, is that the sailors that came in? Right. Do you need them tossed out? Because you've got, you've got a capable crew. No, no, no. They're paying, which is more than you lot can say. And after all, the only reason I asked is because they kind of rubbed me the wrong direction. Downstream. If you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Against the grain. Well, don't let your old father bugger you down anymore. You all get drunk and stay merry, and I'll try to see if I can keep collecting the coin. Do you need any <coughs> help looking behind the stick? Oh, yeah. Can you go back to those Chester drawers in the back and dust beneath them? You want me to dust beneath your drawers? Aye. <coughs> Not quite what I expected to be told, but absolutely, that's what you need for me. As you go back and start to dust the drawers, you can see they haven't been touched because the two Chester drawers house these very perfectly kept glasses and beer steins. One of them is crafted and ornately sigiled with dwarven runes. Silvery pieces eclipse the top and bottom, and a work of different flower and floral patterns are etched out in golden brass. And then, as you begin to dust beneath the chest of drawers, your hand touches something. A small, long, white box is beneath the drawers, Glenn. I, uh, pull it out. Is it a box that I recognize at all? 
similar to the ones that your father would give you on the 17th of Nubian, your birthday. Um, I've had, I'm assuming, at least one, maybe a few birthdays come and go since Quite I've a few. been gone. At Quite least a few. two. Well, now seems as appropriate time as any, and I will open the box. At about that time, a glander conic. Glenn's father looks back at the rest of you as he strokes his mangly black beard. Oh, I watch this. As you open the box, Glenn, light shines through. It is a perfectly preserved copper and bronze accented fishing pole. <laughs> oh, shit. And in dwarven runes on the hilt, right around the side, it says, From your father. With love. I'm gonna take it. Um, can my father see me from like where I'm at? Yes. Uh, holding it in my hands, we'll just give him a nod. Thanks, Pops. Hey. I didn't bring you anything. Should I have mentioned that when I got here? Oh, well, not quite. All right. After all, only one of us knows each other's birthday. No, yours is the 8th of <laughs> Morgenvard. Oh, that's incorrect. It's actually the 7th of Morgenvard. Fuck. But close enough. You know what? Just for that, I'm giving everyone here a free round of drinks. Hey, hey. Some of the people stand up and begin marching their way. <laughs> Everybody hop on this line. <coughs> and remember, the sinker is in two hours, everyone. As they all come up and get their drinks, the drunken minstrel looks up at you, Rez. Oh, wait. I, I wanted to do something before, like, while he was still asleep. Like, at, while, while I was playing and while I was, get, like, once I started getting tired and had a few drinks, I want to call over for one, one more of them as I stop playing. I take a hefty swig of it, so there's maybe like half left. And I look at this minstrel, and I go like a foot in front of him while he's still. <clears throat> and I just splash him. As he looks up, it just melds in with the rest of the meat. He was already sleeping as he licks his lips. Are you? Are you taking requests? Yes, I would like to actually enjoy this party with my friends, so you should do your job and get your ass on stage and try to show up what I just did. So he looks around. Oh yeah, these guys are supposed to be dancing and whatnot. Alright, alright. So he comes uh, up. And then I... Go ahead. And then I go find Larry and find my hat and... See how much money we've made. Oh, okay. look! And as you look throughout the hats, you have made five silver pieces and 22 copper. Ooh. Okay, I give all the copper to Larry. Just keep just keep it for now. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it to her. Thank you for that. As you guys make uh, your way in... And, and then you... I go get... I get more drinks for the table and I go sit down with everyone. As you guys see this line forming, uh, McGlander looks up. I'll be right back. We're running low on taggers. As he goes back up on the stoop, which Glenn is or Rez is performing on, he enters one of the swinging doors and disappears. As the line of patrons circle around the bar, which is in the center of the tavern, they each take their drinks. And one of them. That same bald pirate fellow with a spiderweb tattoo spread across <clears throat> his throat looks back. Oh, well, the prodigal son's returned. How about that? Yeah, I found my way home after after some time away. Seems so you have. So they look around. See that fellow in the back? He points to a fellow that's draped in a brown robe, almost like a Jedi. It covers him and pulls him to the floor. Yeah, what of him? He's wow. so cool. 
He's the best drinker in all the tin towns. Could put you under the table. The best one? That's right. It seems that you've forgotten. Many am I, uh... Uh, exploits in the town since I've been gone. I think I we could all do with a reminder. Bring him to the stick. All right. As they go on, let's see here. Okay. Carl, James, wake up, Stephen. And about that time, they shake the brown guy up, and he shakes himself up and begins walking to the center bar. Are you sure we don't want to do this here? Go get a little messy. Is Rez seeing any of this? Yeah, you are, Rez. Can't hear it, but yeah, you can definitely so... see. <laughs> I, w I walk over at this point. I, I, like, waiting in line to get drinks for everyone. I walk over at this point to, to back up Flynn. You know, I actually know the owner, and I don't think he's going to have too much of a problem with it. All right. All right, Steven, you ready? Yeah. Are you guys about to have a drinking contest? Yeah, you in? Um, no, but I will play background music. There's this awesome song I learned while in a tavern in Kaliste. Uh, it's actually about... I won't sing any of the words because, you know, that's not the point of the, what's about to happen. But it's about, it's really cool, I'll sing it for you sometime. It's about this uh, Kenku who could outdrink anyone. It's actually pretty cool. And it's, it was written by a bard who witnessed him, you know, doing one of these incredible binges. And it's meant to be played in the background of drinking games to be more inspiring. So while you guys do that, Ooh, and I crack my knuckles and I start playing a little tune that starts out pretty slow and it like amps up as they start drinking and as it gets more intense it goes on, you know, yeah. Absolutely. As the song is beginning to take place in your ears, you can't quite hear it yet. It will soon begin when just in time <clears throat> that fellow with the brown robe on leans over. Will you have first or shall I? How's about we uh, parchment boulder shears for it? All right. Dun, 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 so we're gonna roll a d3 each. One is parchment. Two okay. is rapier, and three is uh, or shears. Parchment shears. Boulder. Boulder. Okay, this is a great <laughs> game. They need to add this to the official rules. Go ahead and roll a d3. Yep. So that is... Boulder. Boulder. And that... Shears. Shears. Haha, -ha, you go first, fuckwit. So I didn't mean that, to me. I'm sorry. I'm just quite alright. I've been called worse. At about that time, a ghast fills the tavern as the entire residency of the pub goes quiet. Because beneath the rope is a shark's head. As he takes it oh, back, shit. you can see he has a, oh, massive, a massive shark fin protruding from his back. And coincidentally, oh, coincidentally, right when this begins is the exact same moment that the music picks up from Rez, and he swings over a big, stout taggart of quarter leg. As he brings it back. A 20. Oof. You're next, You're muted. little man. As he brings it up, takes the taggart back, he looks about. You're next, little man. Can't beat Steven! That's right. Constitution saving, saving throw. throw? Okay, cool. Yes, sir. This dude's got a higher modifier than me, guys, so I think, we're st <laughs> I think I'm not going to come out. Oh, I'll take him once he lose. You guys Ooh. watch as Glenn forcefully chokes it down. It's been a while since he's had a drink, but he gets through nonetheless. One of the men pipes up. Oh, you seem to be struggling there. <laughs> I was on a steady diet of salt water for a while, so this is <coughs> new. 
Oh, a <laughs> steady diet of salt water. <laughs> to the well, shark. I suppose another couldn't hurt. Oh. Ooh. Bitch. Pussy. As, as Mead goes out of his nostrils and shoots out of his dorsal hole, everyone kind of giggles and laughs. They sneak in a few drotting jokes. Everybody. Silence! It's your turn. Of course, of course, and, uh, let's just see how this one goes. Oh, just fine. As what? Rez crescendos in his Eastern themed song, and the Kalishtan drums and arcane horns chime in, they come to a crescendo as this massive trawl, a lycanthropic shark, begins puking all over his lap. <laughs> and Glenn has almost been crowned the victor. As people begin to cheer you on, and even Lenara grabs your chair to raise it into the sky. Wait. One more. Are you sure? That was great. The music, like, gets really intense and mellow. The final bout. One more. I demand it. Okay. Best of three. Best. As these two Ooh, taggards... As these two taggards are shoved off, one of the sailors turns his back. As the sailor turns his back and looks on, I need everybody to roll me a perception check. Ooh. Just so we're clear and there's no ifing or buts, the DC is 16. Shit. Yes! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Alright. Everything seems on the up could, and up. Could Glenn have advantage because he's right there? <laughs> no. Alright. Fuck, none of us see it. Let's see here. And he's cheating. Otaku. He's so cheating. Otaku, roll me a check, and you can be the sailor in the back. <laughs> Otaku, you can play he's my def dad. He's definitely listening to music right now. We'll give him five seconds. Four, <laughs> three, two, one. As the drinks, to be fair, you did kill him. I did. Kill, I did. Hits. He is. He's just role playing really well right now. Mm -hmm. And with that, the shark goes to drink his. Good luck, little man. As he drinks it, muted. As he drinks his, it goes down easy. Everyone goes wild. Oh. His modifier is different. Oh, it should be five. I apologize. Twenty-four. He rolled a twenty-four. I can't beat that. I no, you can't. But well, you, you can match it. You just gotta get high enough not to puke. That's it. He's already puked once. Alright. As you struggle to get that one down, everyone looks around and the guy looks up. Alright. Alright. So, he won. I guess that means we need to pay him. And he slides ten gold to you. Well, you've certainly matched us this time, Mr. Connick. Well met. And the three of them begin to turn around. Oh, wait a second. Uh-huh. You're a sailor, aren't you? I have been. Eh, yeah, we know. You left a couple of our boys. Say, do the names Alderdusk or Cory Strike you as familiar? Yeah, they do. I, I spent uh, quite a while with them on uh, my last expedition. Well, maybe it's time we introduced ourselves. You see my bloke here? As he points to a guy with craggly, patchy white hair, liver spots, and a corncob pipe. He has a tricorn which is sodden and stained. This is me friend Carl. Say hello, Carl. Hi. And this bloke, this is me friend James. James smiles queerly out of a very slicked cap, which is on his bald head. He has one eye patch, much like you. You see, Egolin Alderdusk, his brother, and Anders Corey, 
Carl's son. I've been missing ever since they went out on that boat with that insufferable orc. So, where are they? Listen, fellas, tonight's a, a night of merriment. I don't think that tonight's the night we want to talk about the, the fate of the ship that I spent so much time on. No, I do want to talk about the fate of the ship. And you're going to tell me right now. So, step in. What and happened? I, I to look ship? at him. Can, can, can I step in and, and try to get these guys to back off of him? You absolutely can. But, Glenn, as you hear that question, what happened to the ship? You can't feel but compelled to answer. Because the poison that was put in your drink compels you to tell the truth. Oh, you fucks. Okay. As you taste that um, bitter taste on your tongue, you know something is wrong. The ship? Uh, I can't tell you what happened or why. But the ship did explode while we were traveling. And myself, and many others, were lost to the sea. He's lying! At about that time, he looks at Stephen. Those tears you sold us were faulty! No. He tells the truth. <laughs> Fine. Fine! I, quite, if I, I feel quite compelled to do so. Okay, then. So I guess you also wouldn't feel too bad about showing us the shipwreck? After all, you walked on land. I mean, I've been on a bit of a journey since the since the events of that day, but I mean, I bet I could get you there if need be. But I mean, I've got other business to attend to, other than I'm sorry, your two lost family members. Oh, don't worry. Something tells me we're going to find him real soon. At about that time, Iglander, Glenn's father, returns to the bar. I'll meet you here tomorrow, top of the morning, and we'll take off. Find our ship and get to the bottom of what happened to our boys. Got it? I'm happy. You know, we... Sure. Right. Not to. Glander returns. What? What do I miss, huh? With a big smile on his face. Oh, oh. I just won a competition. Nothing serious. That's <coughs> right. Welcome home, Glynn. Uh. He burps, and the three of them walk away. What a dick. I hey, see what's the, Glenn what's handing the price him another the, drink. What's the price of the bottle that we were drinking? Oh, don't worry about it. It's no, no, all no I, I'm asking. My name, the Gavin Clary, is oh. asking. What's the price of the bottle? Two silver. Two silver? That'd be two silver. He turns around, looks at you, and hands you two silver doubloons. I take him. I slide him across the table towards me. And I hand him to my dad as he walks up. As the men walk away and your dad gives a curious eye. Oh, so they turn out to be trouble after all. Ah, uh, not much. I Nothing understand. that a little round of, uh, of drinking couldn't handle. If you'll excuse me, actually, I'm going to head to the latrine. <coughs> Absolutely, you, you know where it is. And I go there and I uh, vomit into uh, the latrine for a few minutes and then return just like trying to present myself as normal as possible as he sees that the alcohol or something else is shaking you are you all right me son i didn't know you were much of a drinker uh, the life on the sea will turn you into one hey listen uh, me son i know i haven't always been there and i should have and we've been away for quite some time so, 
I stopped by a little goblin caravan and had that little uh, wand enchanted for you. Now, wherever you go, you'll have a symbol of your father in your home. It's indestructible as well. I couldn't ask for a better gift, Father. Of course. I'll always be here, and you and all of your friends will have a free room here at the Hook, Line, and Sinker. I've missed you, Pops. I've missed you, Mr. Koenig. Hi. I was wondering if you might be able to direct me to a forge or a smithy. Absolutely. My friend Vondel, he's a red-bearded dwarf. He likes to smoke his pipe and he's got a lot of colorful tattoos. Couldn't mistake him out of the bunch. He's just north of here in a place called Frozen Far Expeditions. Thank you. And I'm gonna stand up, look at the party, look down at my missing arm. I, uh, I suppose I could use a hand. Uh, I, <coughs> I, I stop Alistair and I bring over Arnholt and I say, do you think you could make him something functional? Maybe not a cannon, but something? I, I can... I can work something up. On hold, go with him. Help him if he needs it. All right. Uh, I can be of service uh, as well if need be. It's all go. You lead the way, Captain. Hey, um, I'm gonna put down a gold piece at the bar to show gratitude for the drinks and make my way out. As you guys make your leave, Iglander holds his hands up. All right. Now who's ready for the sinker? Uh, Turns around, party leaves and roars! <laughs> as they make their way out and the door shuts, those of you still in the tavern see as a bunch of sailors get around the bar and get ready for the last drink of the night. The sinker. However, as Resident the rest of you guys... Oh, good. As the rest of you make your way to Frozen Fire Expeditions, you guys see outside three pairs of footsteps, not even trying to be hit, just walk straight out the back and begin arcing their way up the slopes towards the top of the mountain. If you guys would like to press on, you witness this sight and step in. As you guys walk, the air is thick with soot. As you cling your feet on the ground, you can literally see dust expelling from the floorboards. As it creaks and echoes in your step, you walk towards the back of the room, at which point you see one sight, a dwarf, his face wrought and seasoned with wear, illuminated only by the flames flicker flickering from a wooden pipe. As he brings its curled bell off of his lips, Well, hello, dear. Welcome to Frozen Far. Now may I be of service. My name is Captain Alistair Davies. A pleasure to I... meet you, Captain Alistair Davies. I am Vondel of the Dwarves. I'm wondering if I might take use of your forge for the night. Aye, of course. I usually charge one gold for the night. However, you make it a golden half. You came highly recommended from the Connig family. Mr. Connig himself directed me out here. I appreciate that. When you're good at your craft, word travels very quickly. You see, I need to reforge a new arm for myself. My old one got destroyed. Is that so? And what became of your arm? I'm going to pull out my old blueprints for my first cannon arm. I show them, hey, this is what I have, but I'm going to pull out my new blueprints that I was working on before we stormed the castle. But I, uh, I'm looking to make a new one. At about that time, he puts his pipe down. Eyes. 
Have you been working with the gnomes, by chance? Not by chance, no. It's just that this is an absolutely exquisite blueprint. You must really know your handiwork, Mr. Alistair. I have inspiration from a rather unique source. There is a door right behind me. You and your unique source are welcome to open it and access the forge for as long as the gold continues to flow. And uh, would you by chance have any raw materials about I might can take off your hands? Gold, of course, come in. I do not have any gold, copper, or silver. It was taken from me like many of the valuable items in this far village. Perhaps some iron, steel. I have got plenty of that. It'll be right below you, next to the anvil, in the door behind me. And I'll give him 50 gold. A down payment. He puts it in a bag that he stores right beneath his very knotted red beard. Well, stay there as long as you need. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to get started on my arm first. I'm going to use iron. Um, I'm going to melt down two sets of armor I have. Um, a little bit of brass. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bits of bone and the skulls I've collected. I'm going to make my shoulder a skull and my elbow a skull and then yeah. bones up and down the arm and then the uh the back of my hand um i'm going to saw off the face of one of the skulls and so it's going to be a skull face on my hand with the teeth being at the knuckles that's fucking badass that kicks so much ass like <laughs> that is really um, fucking cool and then um, I'd like to take some extra time to build the modifications so I can switch between the different types of Eldritch Cannons. Um, I'd like to make it like a sort of like a revolving barrel on the forearm that I can just, on an action, I can switch it around to the different types. Give me an intelligence check and add your proficiency. Okay. This is the first thing you've crafted that is not explicitly detailed in the rules. Wait, here's intelligence, and my proficiency is plus two. Wow. So this has been taking longer than you thought. Getting the mechanism just right to flex with the radial spire, which arcs through the arm, is more difficult than you thought. But you inevitably get it. And after about half an hour, you guys in the front watch Vondel, without a word, steps in the back where the an anvil is. And just shuts the door behind him. So that is a, a pretty piece you have there. Uh, thank you. Say, so, uh, you seem to have a lot of gold. It doesn't, uh, well, strike your fancy much. But I am looking for adventurers right now. And uh, you seem the most capable out of all of your friends. And what are you looking for? A man who is willing to slay a beast. That seems to be my line of work as of late. You and every damn king of hell I encounter. What beast do you want slain? She is a yeti. With red fur. Do yeti. Um, do a kind of pet the fur that I've now sewn to my lapels and collar and inside of my coat. Yeti. Red fur. I and, uh, where were you, where would I find this yeti? He rubs a soot out of a nearby bay window, and he points to the top of the mountain.
her she is. Last I saw her, and no doubt she still waits for us. Alright, I can handle your beastie. No problem. I'm glad. Do you think the rest of your friends will have objection? They might. I can't guarantee anything, but I'll slay you, beastie. Thank you. He turns around, opens the bar in the door, and swings it open. If you can imagine, even more soot and smoke billows into this place with an active forge, coolant chamber, and an anvil. As he walks back in, Hello, all of you. I have been very rude since you've come here, and I apologize. My name is Vondel. I'm simple dwarf with simple mission. I go to kill Yeti, who has killed my axe beaks and many of my pets. I will pay you in several ways. I have 100 gold pieces, and I can also give you barrier tattoo. I and uh, tell me more of this tattoo. It um, goes on your skin, much like mine. It was taught to me by the people of the mountain. Once they passed on their profession, I administer it to people who I deem worthy. I will kill the beastie. Good, good. She walks back into the room with all of you now. So, are you ready to go? Not quite. I got one last thing to do, and I'm going to make a very simple but usable prosthetic arm for the favorite of the brothers. <laughs> After about another hour using the forge, you guys see Aralas come, a Alistair come out. As he removes his spectacles of dark vision, you can see a line of soot that's clung to his face. But he does have two arms. Well, technically three. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Alistair. I, I had no idea it would be so elegant. And now he's got to attach it. <laughs> I'm going to use a leather strap Ooh. harness system where it goes over his head and over onto the other shoulder to pull it to his body and then tighten it like a belt. Not bad. Oh, thank you for not ma maiming my brother. <laughs> not bad at all. Hey, Rez, look. Oh, Rez isn't there. Rez is getting hammered. Oh, that's true. Hey, Glenn, this look. This is what I'll do. I think I'm also getting hammered. Okay. <laughs> Aurora, so you doing the same? Uh, I'm still in the bar, I guess. But I'm pacing yeah. because uh, this is uh, going crazy. Yeah, Rez and Glenn are going like balls to the wall. Like you're yeah. seeing the party side of Rez that you've never seen before. Like you've seen him perform, but you've never seen him party. Like he, yeah, he's bringing a whole new life to this to this bar. As the rest of the heroes are inside of Frozen Fire Expeditions, getting themselves ready, and the rest of you are in the tavern. A very warm and hospitable setting, though without one face that normally accompanies you. Larry stretches her taloned thumb over the face of the rock and rubs it a couple times. And that's where we're going to leave Larry, it. Larry, how... Until next week. Uh, Go ahead, Russ. Damn. No, it, it was nothing. That's it. We'll pick up in Karakonic next week. I can't believe Gasper's character fucking died. I know! He came back for his first session in so long and just fucking died. <laughs>